good evening good morning good afternoon welcome to the first episode of the indian military history podcast i am vikram dalal and today we are joined with a very special guest colonel sk dalal from the indian army he uh, served in the indian army for more than 30 years and 12 years out of that was in the kashmir valley so a plethora of knowledge plethora of stories uh, that we have to go into so uh, thanks for taking on the time papa uh, i i thank forgot you. to mention he's also my dad <laughs> thank you thanks a lot good morning good evening everyone yeah thanks for taking out the time i'm super excited about this the first time we're doing a podcast so a uh, lot of things to get into um so in in today's episode uh, i was thinking we would go, we would go into uh you know how they say that we should understand our own military capabilities but equally as important as that is to understand the capabilities of your adversary of your enemies right and our biggest adversary historically our biggest enemy no points for guessing who that is that is pakistan so in today's episode we'll be discussing the military history of independent pakistan all the generals who led the uh, pakistani military their uh, you know their experiences their performance throughout their tenures and all kinds of political interference that went into during that time period so let's begin so that the first question the the first thing that always came to my mind was that you know prior to independence india and pakistan were, were the same country and you know we had the same military we were all trained by we were the british indian armed forces british british indian military trained by the same uh, set of values set of cultures but after so many years after decades of independence we what we've seen is that the indian armed forces went a very different a very professional direction and the pakistani armed forces went into a direction where there was a lot of political interference from their side into their in, internal affairs and their foreign policy so th- that is the first question that i wanted to ask you was what is the reason behind this like why did the pakistani military end up going in such a 180 degree different direction as compared to the indian military yeah what happened was in 1947 the indian armed forces got divided into the indian army as well as pakistan army now pakistan was based on religious lines and uh, those muslims when serving in the indian armed forces british indian armed forces rather who wanted to migrate to pakistan they migrated to pakistan army armed forces and the some muslims continued to serve within the indian army too now at that time there was a lot of uh, instability a lot of things were unclear and uh, the pakistani officers who joined the local pakistani officers who joined were not of very senior rank as was in the indian army too the both the armies were at that time commanded by the commanders in chief were britishers the pakistan army had uh, first sir claude okinek then frank mesherby took over from him and then sir douglas david gracie these were the three british commanders in chief of pakistan army during this time only the disputes between india and pakistan started over the uh, kashmir basically as also junagadh junagadh was uh, resolved quite early but kashmir continued to create a crisis situation with both the countries both the countries uh, declaring that they uh, have a right to kashmir pakistan was asking uh, for kashmir because it is a muslim majority muslim muslim majority state yep. and india banked on the constitutional system that the king had the right to secede either to india or to pakistan right one of the two now this situation the king delhi dallied maharaj hari singh delhi dallied and he did not take a decision after 15th august 1947 that is the time when the pakistanis decided to launch the lashkars or tribal tribal uh, warriors into kashmir 
to wrest control, to take control of the uh, region as far as uh, as much as possible. Now these Lashkars were disorganized and they were not in very well. They were not very well organized. Therefore, a Pakistani army major general Akbar Khan he decided to take on this gauntlet. He secretly met uh, Jinnah. Yep. And uh, both of them, they decided to secretly, without letting the chief commanders in chief uh, know about what was happening, they decided to intervene in Pakistan, intervene in Kashmir. Now, the commanders in chief on both the sides were in conversation with each other, and the commanders in commander in chief of Pakistan army was not keen to have the British uh, officers led. Uh, armed forces on both the sides to clash with each other. Therefore, they advised that Pakistan army was not to get involved into any skirmish or fight when in Kashmir. And it was uh, left to the Lashkars or the tribals to take control of Kashmir as much as possible. The Indian army at a stage decided to get in full throttle when it was clear that Indian army was in uh, the battle in full. And there were, it was also clear to the Pakistani commanders in commander in chief that the Pakistan army soldiers were also part of the Lashkars. They finally decided to that the Pakistan army needed to get involved in the fight. Okay. So this is where the seeds of Pakistan army dabbling into politics were born. On the other hand, the Indian army was not getting involved into politics. Neither did Nehru devil with any general, nor did uh, Patel devil with any general, and they decided to they the Pakistan Indian Army stayed away from politic politicians and the politics. Now so, this seed, which was uh, born at that at that time, has continued to grow further and further, and the Pakistan Army has always been after that deeply involved into Pakistan politics. The Pakistani Army officers thought that they were the right people to put Pakistan on the right direction. Okay. Now, one more thing I would like to add that the Muslim League took control of Pakistan. Muslim yep. League was led by Jinnah. The Prime Minister was Liaquat Ali. Now, Muslim League had no very, had very little base in uh, Pakistan. Bangladesh, it had a base, but not in Pakistan. The uh, NWFP at that time, Northwest Frontier Province, was under the control of the uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. The yeah. Punjab was instable after the Nationalist Party had decided to give in to Muslim uh, Muslim leaguers creating chaos. Sindh was under a bit of Muslim con uh, league control, but uh, overall the population was not with the Muslim League as much as it was in. The, as much as the Muslims of the Indian side of the subcontinent. Now, this itself gave credence to the fact that the politicians were on a weak wicket. I and see. It gave energy to the. It gave energy and uh, it gave uh, you know credence to the fact that uh, the Pakistan Army had uh, armed forces, senior officers had a role to play to ensure that the Pakistan. Pakistan got what it needed, what it uh, was, you know, what it was destined to get in during the partition. This is how the seeds were born. Yeah. So it seems like uh, the two major reasons for this is that first of all, a precedent was set where uh, the British generals, who were the first generals of the Pakistan army, they said that no interference of the Pakistani military, so they had to. Uh, do away with the military hierarchy and then just uh, go directly to the political es establishment within Pakistan. So that sort of set that precedent that okay, it's, it's okay to uh, sort of dabble more closely with the politicians of Pakistan. And yeah. secondly, the uh, the Muslim League, which was the uh, the the foremost political party over there, did not have much of a standing. So yeah. the credibility of the Pakistani military was higher. And that's why their political in interference. So there was a precedence, there was an opportunity that sort of uh, created the seeds for that. And, and in, fact, in fact, it grew a lot over the decades. Yeah. 
it was not a question of really credibility to the question of the pakistan army taking army generals taking on, upon themselves the task of uh, setting things in order in pakistan they mm -hmm. took it upon themselves and secretly jinnah also uh, talked to them secretly and then they also transferred the weapons and all in secrecy mm -hmm. without the british officers coming to know of it to the lashkars yeah makes sense if would would it also be fair to say that uh, because of the uh, religious component within the Pakistani military as well, as compared to the secular component of the Indian military, the religious component played a role in in them being more uh, more politically inclined as well. Yeah, obviously, because the those Muslims who migrated to Pakistan armed forces were they migrated basically either they were from uh, west pakistan part of they were originally uh, they were uh, you know from that region from west pakistan mm -hmm. that was logical for them to join the west pakistan uh, the pakistani armed forces west pakistan or east pakistan those people who were in the rest of the who were from indian part of the subcontinent mm -hmm. they joined the pakistan army on religious lines it was Religion. understood so therefore, religiosity had a factor to play in all this. Mm, makes sense. Well, speaking of uh, some of the uh, army officers who were Muslims, but they also so they joined the Pakistani military, but there were some uh, Muslim officers who did not and ended up joining, staying with the Indian military. Uh, one of the most prominent uh, members that come to mind is Brigadier Muhammad Usman, who was the yeah. uh, Share of Noshera, he fought bravely, Noshera, yeah. fought very bravely in Noshera and uh, even in Jhangar, where he lost his life uh, uh, in 1948, July 3rd. Yeah. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, those officers as well who stayed back and then they really fought for their country. It was, yeah. We'll be we'll be going into the details of each and every war in subsequent podcasts. But this is more generally about the um, the military history of yeah. uh, of of the of the Pakistan military. So so okay. So now we have moved on. So we we are here. The Pakistani military they created Operation Gulmarg. It was partially successful. They were able to take control of a part of Kashmir, but the objective of capturing the overall Kashmir was not completed. And then uh, the British generals uh, slowly are uh, gone. And then now we have the first Pakistani general who was the chief of army yeah. staff of the Pakistani military, and that is Ayub Khan. Yeah, what happened was that uh, General Gracie did not agree to many of uh, the uh, actions that uh, the Pakistan government under Liaquat Ali wanted. And gradually he was eased out. General Ayub Khan. He was a major general at that time. He was appointed as the commander in chief on 17 January 1951. Now, Oyub Khan's background was a slightly doubtful. He, when he was a brigadier and the promotion time came to be, uh, when, when his promotion uh, you know, was to be decided, Muhammad Ali Jinnah did not want him to be promoted. He oh. said that this officer is a very average officer and he did, does not deserve to be made, uh, made to be taking up the rank of major general. However, he was given the rank of major general, a local rank, which uh, local rank in the armed forces, Pakistan and India, is a local last night. Normally, we give a sepoy who does good work as a sepoy. He is given a local last night rank without any pay and, all, pay and all. This is the kind of rank which he was given initially. And he was given very, you know, those sedentary kind of jobs, which were not uh, the ones which are combat uh, kind of roles. Okay. Now, in the Second World War also, he was commanding uh, his battalion. At that time, the GOC asked him to ask the battalion to launch an attack on in the Burma campaign, I think. That is the time when uh, Ayub Khan told the GOC that his battalion is not ready at that time. His battalion is too tired. His men are tired. His officers are tired. They need a bit of rest. And uh, they cannot attack, uh, get into attack mode at this time. This was taken by the GOC as uh, a sort of, you know, backing off from operations, active operations, mm -hmm. or leading somewhere closer to cowardice, not exactly cowardice. 
and he was eased out of the command. He was removed from there, and he was uh, then put on some other assignments. Okay. This is his background. He was otherwise also his uh, course mates and all. They talk of him as a very average officer. He was not a uh, uh, very bright person, not uh, in that category. But he developed political skills. He uh, got into, you know, got closer to close to politicians as also to the Western world. He started hobnobbing quite early in 1947 or 46, even with the Americans. Now, well, the, the, the sorry, so so the Americans had a uh, had a lot of folks over here in Pakistan, or was he posted somewhere in the U.S. or in some in the West? No, they, he must have got into some. You know, people say it is all you know speculation. Actually, it is not confirmed. But then people say that he got close to Americans, or the Americans uh, found him a pliable person. Either way, because Pakistan's uh, geostrategic location is such that uh, America wanted to take, uh, wanted to have a say in Pakistan affairs from early days, because of its uh, close proximity to Central Asia, to USSR, as to well USSR, to in Middle East, Iran. All these were trouble spots. Okay. So, therefore, the uh, Americans must have had some influence. Now, it is quite surprising that the uh, commander in chief uh, after Gracie, who was the local, the Pakistani commander in chief after Gracie, who was to take over, he was in London at that time. He was asked to take over as the commander in chief. During his flight, uh, his flight crashed while on the move from London to Pakistan, which is quite. Uh, you know, quite suspicious. It is not a very normal thing for the uh, new commander in chief to take over. When he's coming to take over, his flight crashes and he dies on the way. This, this is, is not the, a very normal situation. This is the, the Pakistani general who uh, yeah. General Gracie recommended to be the chief of staff for the Pakistani military. His... Not General Gracie, the Pakistani established the uh, prime minister and uh, prime minister Liaquat Ali wanted okay. him to become the prime minister. He had decided that this person will be the prime minister. He called him, and on the way his plane crashed. Thereafter, Ayub Khan was made the prime minister. Now it is uh, uh, still unknown why nobody knows why what reasons were there for Liaquat Ali to make uh, Ayub Khan as the you know, commander in chief. Because he did not uh, have the caliber, everybody knew it. Muhammad Ali Jinnah had made it plain and simple. Still, Liaquat Ali went ahead with making him the commander in chief. Is there a possibility that there might have been pressures on uh, Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan uh, from the West to uh, instate uh, the, Ayub, Ayub Khan? Yeah, the way things were in Pakistan, Nehru was a different person. Nehru wanted to get into non-alignment from early days. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, he wanted to maintain distance from the USA and from USSR, both sides. But Pakistan case was quite different. From the beginning, only the Western world or even the USSR must have realized that the, Pakist uh, that the Pakistan army senior officers were dabbling into politics. So therefore, they found that uh, these are the people whom we can always we can manipulate, and uh, we can ensure that uh, after a bit of, you know, pulls and pressures, we can ensure that these people control the reins of the country. Mm. It is more convenient. It is an understood fact that uh, any superpower in the world, it, for any superpower in the world to control a democracy is more difficult because yeah. a democracy has the pulls and pressures of the population of the yeah. People. Democracies they, are messy. Democracies are messy. Yeah. And therefore, uh, it was easy and convenient for them to deal with one person as a dictator. Right. We're talking of Liaquat Ali. Liaquat Ali himself was personally inclined towards non alignment. He wanted close relations with USA. He wanted USA to arm their armed, armed forces and he wanted USA to help them raise the armed forces. Mm -hmm. But he personally was also not very inclined to joining a particular bloc in full. And uh, surprisingly, Liaquat Ali was assassinated while addressing a public meeting at Rawalpindi. 
mm-hmm. in 1951 itself. Okay. After a few few months after the uh, after Ayub Khan took over. So the person who Liaquat Ali Khan wanted to be the first chief of staff uh, dies mm-hmm. in a plane accident. Oh, sorry, mm-hmm. commander in chief dies in a plane accident, and Liaquat Ali is also assassinated some time later, and yeah. very convenient <laughs> for for whoever wanted that to happen. Yeah, I would say. Because okay. Liaquatali, Liaquatali was a well-educated, well-articulated person. He wanted his own policies. So therefore, there must have been something. And mm-hmm. uh, the surprising part is, whenever such, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, there have been some assassinations in Pakistan of yeah. the top people. First was Liaquatali. Second was, uh, like, Bhutto was obviously hanged. Uh, he was legally assassinated, I would say. Yeah. And uh, Benazir Bhutto was killed. In both the cases of Benazir as well as in Liak, uh, in Liakat Ali's case especially, the person who fired the two shots that killed Liakat Ali, that person was killed instantly at that time only by the police, by the police who was gu- who were guarding the person. So there, no, there was no evidence left. Yeah, sounds so a lot like, a, yeah, that sounds a lot like the JFK assassinations where Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald is the, the quote-unquote shooter and then he's also assassinated. So now the whole... Uh, the no, no, the string is no, gone. There were no after that. Uh, there were no leads anyway. Exactly. And so this the last person was a, This yeah. person was a known hired assassin. Okay. The person who killed him, killed Yakatali, fired the shots, was a known hired assassin. He was a so there, Nobody knew who, who did it. Right. But uh, Ayub Khan, you know, then started playing a larger role. The government became weak. The yeah. governor general who took over was yeah. uh, also. A weak person, he appointed the prime minister. Then in 1954, the governor general Gulam, his name, uh, I'm forgetting his name. Would it huh. be f- sorry? Would sorry. it be Khwaja fair? Khwaja Najimuddin, Khwaja Najimuddin, okay. governor general Khwaja Najimuddin. He dismissed the government of the prime, that prime minister in 1954, oh. and he, uh, the country was unstable, unstable. He then re- asked Ayub Khan to take to control the situation. A sort of a martial law was established, and Ayub Khan was in fact now controlling the uh, situation, internal situation in the country from 1954 now, onwards. So, 1954 yeah. is it fair to say that Pakistan was a dictatorship right, in 1954? Not exactly. He was just uh, uh, he was under the governor general. And the governor general was not was not elected, though. No, he was also one of those Muslim leaders who, who were the senior leaders. They uh, took power one by one. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that if Liaquat Ali Khan survived, and he sort of like Nehru was able to run the country for around 15, 20 years after uh, India got independence, Liaquat Ali Khan could have been that figure for Pakistan where political institutions could have been developed and some uh, some uh, demo- democratic institutions w- w- would have been developed during that time and Pakistan would have gone on a different trajectory if he was not assassinated like that. Would it be fair to say that? To, to a large extent, yes. The, it was very well known that Muhammad Ali Jinnah was not to live long after 1947. Right. People knew about his. The, it was a sec, uh, it was a open secret that he would not live very long, mm-hmm. and uh, he died. But Liaquat Ali was the right hand man of Jinnah, the chosen right hand man of Jinnah. Mm-hmm. He was well educated. He was educated in UK, and uh, he had all the experience of uh, a statesman. He also could have, you know. Uh, come up in the same manner as Nehru. Mm. And uh, he could have steered the country to a better political setup, to a better balanced yeah. democratic setup. Yeah. Mm. So it's a, it's a pretty big missed opportunity for them, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right. So now we are at 1955. Uh, martial law has been declared. Ayub Khan has a lot no. of powers. He's still... Ayub I'm Khan sorry. was the commander in chief was to be appointed for 30. Sorry for you wanted to say continue or should I continue? Oh no no I was just saying that yeah so it's uh, uh, Ayub Khan uh, uh, he's reporting or uh, he's 
reporting to the govern governor general and a lot of political institutions have been diminished by 1955 yeah. and yeah. ayub khan himself has gained a lot of power internally ayub khan helped a lot uh, the khwaja nazimuddin was helped by ayub khan a lot to stay in power and he had ensured that the uh, situation in the internal situation in the country remained under control Mm-hmm. Therefore, the commander in chief were tenure was four years, 1951 to 1955. 1955, he was given another four years extension by the regime. Okay, so quid pro quo. Yeah. So because the regime was happy with his uh, with what was what he was doing. In the mm-hmm. meantime, he had got he had uh, they had built close relations with the, the United States, and 1955 or so they joined Seattle and Cento. The okay. uh, security power blocks of the Western world, Southeast okay. Asia Treaty Organization and Central Treaty Organization. Now, when these, uh, with this, the why they joined was, there were two, three reasons. If you look at it from the professional angle, the mm-hmm. Pakistan army lacked the weaponry that they needed for the army to, uh, they had very clear intent. Uh, well, it was very clear that Pakistan's enemy was India, and they had to match India's capabilities. So okay. therefore, they wanted the Pakistan army to be armed mm-hmm. for that, and they did not have the money also. Mm-hmm. So they wanted uh, this weaponry to come to them as aid or uh, as a bit quid pro quo for joining the Western world. Therefore, in 1955, they logically joined in a in a way logically joined the west the western power block and they gave uh, uh, they they gave uh, access to some air, air, uh, what do you call that uh, air bases air bases yep. in especially in around peshawar mm-hmm. where the from where the spy plane u2 spy plane used to fly and go over the complete ussr and return back okay this, so uh, these bases were given by Pakistan, and in return, Pakistan got the tanks and the armory, etc., from mm-hmm. USA at sort of, you know, easier on easier terms, I would say. Yeah. Okay, got it. So now, 1955 is when Pakistan officially joins the Western Bloc, yeah. while India is non-aligned. Yeah. And you also mentioned that. Uh, Pakistan at, at that time, you know, it needed all those uh, sophisticated armaments, weaponry to be a- able to match uh, the strength of the Indian military because what Indian military had was numerical superiority that Pakistan could not match. So they had to compensate for that with better weapons. You mentioned that Pakistan considered India as an enemy at that time. The re- Would you say the reason for that is that, okay, in 1947, 1948, their objective of taking Kashmir was not fulfilled, and that was the reason why they would be like, why they considered India, Indian military as their biggest enemy, or was it more around insecurities that they had that India, such a big country, can attack us at any time, and it has we have such a they have such a long border with india and they could come in from any side and then just take us over or attack us which one would you say would be a bigger reason for them considering us as an enemy yeah pakistan firstly uh, i'll answer this a uh, bit late uh, firstly the pakistani politicians did not uh, go into establishing various uh, institutional institutions and institutional they did not uh, get into creating institutional setups like uh, what Nehru did he mm-hmm. Nehru got into uh, the five-year plans five-year development plans and yeah. the country started getting you know assistance from outside as part of the five-year plan there was no such uh, planned uh, organized uh, you know, economic development or the even the political development was not there on the politician side. So the politician, the politics remained. Politicians remained weak. Mm-hmm. Now, when you talk of uh, the enmity between India and Pakistan, there were two reasons. One that they were not able to wrest control of Kashmir. That is obviously mm-hmm. the main reason. Mm-hmm. And why they wanted Kashmir was because of Muslim majority, 
and that drives us onto the point that uh, the uh, division of the subcontinent took uh, place based on the two nation theory right now two nation theory pakistan said that muslims are a, di are a distinctly different nation whereas the indian side said no indian uh, uh, all the people who belong to the subcontinent are one yep. they did not distinguish between uh, people of the subcontinent on religious lines. So the mm -hmm. two nation theory was balked at in India, whereas Pakistan accepted the Pakistan wanted the two nation theory to be accepted. Mm -hmm. This was the the creation of Pakistan took place based on the two nation theory. And uh, when when Indians talked against it, they took it as a threat to their, you know, existence, basic existence. Mm -hmm. So both the uh, issues were involved. Yeah. Okay. So it is that it is that uh, unattained objective of, of of Kashmir, but a much larger issue of the of whether or not they even uh, accept our existence in the subcontinent. Okay. Yeah. So in insecurities were were also a huge component of that. Okay. So now Ayub Khan, he has joined the Western Bloc. He started to get all those cool armaments from the from the West. Does that include the patent tanks also? Yes, uh, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> the, famous the famous patent, patent tanks. tanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so they also started coming in. So now they're like, so now they're getting more and more bold that, okay, with all these sophisticated armaments, we can take on India and we can do a sweep campaign within India. Uh, and that's when Ayub Khan's first major incursion or engagement uh, or military campaign would... Uh, uh, we could say with India happened in 1965, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Before that, 62 had happened. India had suffered a defeat against China. Uh, India, uh, a few times, uh, a little bit later, India had lost its first Prime Minister Nehru. And Lal Bahadur Shastri, who was, the perception was that he was politically weak. So that perception had come about that India was militarily as well as politically weak. And Ayub Khan, all this time, had been getting all those cool armaments. And that's when he thinks that, OK, this is the time where we can strike. This is our opportunity of finishing the unfinished business of taking Kashmir. Yeah. Now, after 1955, Ayub Khan became bolder. As the mm -hmm. army got the weaponry, he the, and the assistance, economic assistance also was provided by the West. The mm -hmm. country started seeing better you know times so ayub khan then realized that he is the one who is controlling the affairs of the state and uh, there is a governor general sitting on top of him just for nothing so mm -hmm. he decided to himself become the head of the state in 1958 mm -hmm. he told the governor general to okay thank you you can go and i am now the president of uh, pakistan he okay. was uh, continuing as the Commander in chief, and now in 1958 he became the president of Pakistan. Okay, so that, so he is, had a dual role, the president yeah. as well as the commander in chief. Got it. Yeah. So he now had to control the political as well as the military situation, both sides. Now, Ayub Khan remained uh, as the uh, president from 1958 to about 1967. I think he ended over to Yahya Khan. During this time, he fought the 1965 war, as you said. 1965 in April, the Pakistanis decided to Pakistanis launched a small little operation in the run of Kutch to test the Indian waters. That's in Gujarat. The Indian, that's in Gujarat. Yeah, run of Kutch in Gujarat. Okay. Now the Indian uh, Indians did not accept expect it, and the Indian response was sort of I would say sort of weak, the weak and uh, sort of late. Okay. Though the response was there, but it came late and it was weak. This is where the feeling came in Ayub Khan's mind that the Indian political setup, the Indian political leadership was not decisive. The diminutive figure of Lal Badr Shastri also helped in making his helped Ayub Khan making up this mind. Now, mm -hmm. Ayub Khan had uh, was a Pathan mm -hmm. and uh, he had this, you know. Uh, and these uh, funny ideas, I would say, <laughs> about the some uh, communities yeah. being of inferior quality, right. especially about the Bengalis. 
when he took over in 1958. Now, I, I'll just discuss the Bangladesh issue also here. The Bangladesh uh -huh. issue had already started. Mm -hmm. Now, he used to talk of Bangladesh's uh, Bengalis as people of inferior race, people of inferior quality. So at, and, at this time, Pakistan was West Pakistan, which is now Pakistan, and East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. Yeah. And East yeah. Pakistan was majority uh, Bengalis, Bengalis, and yeah. West Pakistan was the rest of uh, current Pakistan, which does not yeah. have a lot of Bengalis. Yeah. Right. After 1947, we'll discuss this Bangladesh issue at this stage. What yeah. Ayub Khan's role in Bangladesh issue? That will be that we can close. 1947, 48. When uh, 48, the um, Pakistan government decided that they will follow a one language policy. The country, entire country, will uh, the national language will be Urdu. Mm -hmm. Not uh, they did not recognize Bengali. Whereas the Bengali speaking East Bengal people, predominantly Bengali, 95 percent. So they wanted that Bengali should also be recognized as a national language, but yeah. the uh, government decided against it. So therefore, agitations for Bengali to be included as the national language started in 1948 itself. And uh, thereafter, when especially when after Ayub Khan took over in 1958, he with this mindset of Bengalis being of inferior race, they did not deserve to be, you know, uh, to be getting what they should have got. He allotted the allotted resources much lesser than they should have than what should have been allotted to Bangladesh to East Pakistan. I would say mm -hmm. the development activities in East Pakistan were at a much lower level than mm -hmm. in West Pakistan. Okay. As also the East Pakistanis were not joining the armed forces. Most most of the armed forces were West Pakistani based. Okay. Uh, West Pakistani manned, I would say. So now this uh, in 1954, the Awami League, that was the main political party in Bangladesh, they they organized uh, their uh, session. In 1954 session, they declared that uh, they had. Uh, they declared that their demands from the central government were that they wanted the state to be run in a manner that the central government controls three subjects st uh, the um, external affairs the defense that is the uh, defense subject and the currency okay they they did not want anything more than this Mm -hmm. So and uh, as also they uh, they declared that they want the national language to be uh, Bengali also to be a part of the national language in mm -hmm. addition to Urdu. Yeah, so so they were basically asking for more state rights, state rights, more state rights, and uh, more. They asked for uh, equal status. Right. Actually, it it, uh, it came to equal status as compared to West Pakistan. Right. It came to that. Logically, that was correct also. Yeah, Ayub Khan, when he after he become uh, after he became the president, he suppressed the Bengalis more and more. Hmm. Now coming back to 1965, the same opinion which he held about uh, Bengalis, the same opinion he almost the same opinion he held about any person who was of a diminutive figure. Lal Badu Shastri was fell into that category, so he thought that the for the reaction in run of cuts by the mm -hmm. Indian side was slow. Mm -hmm. The politicians were afraid they did not, they could not take decisions in time. Therefore, he could now strike at Kashmir and take Kashmir in one go. So seems like he had an assumption or a hypothesis that okay, India is militarily weak, India is politically weak, and this incident at the run of Kutch acted as a validation of that hypothesis that okay, that that whatever my hypothesis was that's right we can go ahead and start our operations and that's where so this was in april of 1965 they started operation gibraltar in uh, august of 1965 on 8th august 20, yeah 8th august yeah 8th august 1965 and then by i, I think by 26 27th all of them were captured that, that's what i remember but i, I may be wrong <laughs> I may be yeah. wrong on this. So yeah, no, no, so they no, no. launched in August, August 1965. Yeah. So they launched Operation Gibraltar. So now let's go into mm -hmm. Operation Gibla uh, Gibraltar, then Grand Slam, and then India's response, and then we can talk about uh, Ayub Khan's the assessment of 
his performance during the 1965 campaign. Now, Ayub Khan was the commander in chief till 19, from 1955, he got a four year extension till 1959. And thereafter, he extended, gave himself extension of one more year. Mm -hmm. He was commander in chief for nine years. Okay. Then he chose Jan Musa to be the next commander in chief, 1960 okay. or so. He gave one extension to Jan Musa. So Jan Musa was commander in chief for about eight years, it was 1959 or so to 1967, somewhere around that. He was the commander in chief for eight years. So he was the actual commander in chief during the 1965 campaign, but a a lot of the Just military decisions would let me concerned. let me yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Jal Musa was a very you know pliable person. Mm -hmm. He would not uh, uh, confront uh, General Ayub Khan, Field Marshal Ayub Khan, and uh, he, Ayub Khan knew that he would dictate the terms, whereas the on paper the commander chief would be Jal Musa. Okay. So, so yes, that is why Jal Musa was uh, put in place, and he was also given an extension. Yeah. So, so General Musa was basically a yes man. Yes man, a de facto commander in chief remained. Ayub Khan remained a de facto commander in chief mm -hmm. during this during his time. Okay. Okay. 1965 operations. They launched the uh, their tribe, their lashkars, their you know mercenaries. I would say, and those people they fanned into the Kashmir Valley. They were soon detected and they were uh, you know that particular operation failed hmm. thereafter the pakistan army decided to launch an offensive in this offensive the major activity that took place from pakistan side was the attempt to capture aknur the pakistanis launched a major offensive into aknur sector. can you can you give a little bit uh, more context around the importance of aknur ge the geographic location of that so that we can get more idea about how how vital Aknur as a small town is from a military standpoint. No, Aknur is about thirty kilometers from Jammu. Yeah. Okay. To the northwest of north northwest of Jammu, north northwest of Jammu. Now, when you Aknur is uh, there is a bridge on the river Chenab in Aknur. Mm -hmm. When you when the Pakistanis take control of Aknur, they automatically then they cut off the districts of Rajori and Punch from Jammu. Rajori and Punch have the links to to the south. They have they are linked to Jammu by road by the road uh, Jammu Punch Jammu Rajori Punch, mm -hmm. which passes through Aknur, uh, which by which uh, goes through the same region Aknur. And uh, on the other side, on the northern side and north eastern side, they have the Peer Panjal ranges. Mm -hmm. Pir Panjal ranges uh, could be, you know, crossed to, one could cross to the Kashmir Valley. There was only one road, uh, pliable road, which uh, was linking the Kashmir Valley to Pir Panjal range, other than the, other than the, you know, the uh, road which uh, the Indian Army, uh, Indian Armed Forces have been using, that is the uh, what do you call that? Uh, the uh, the, the Srinagar Jammu Road, right? Srinagar Jammu Highway. Highway. That, uh, in other other than that, there is only one. There was only one place, and that was joining, linking Udi to Punch. Oh, is is that the one which had the the Haji Pir Pass, which was yes. captured in nineteen forty? Okay. Yeah, Haji Pir Pass was the one which uh, was there on this axis. That is the axis which linked Jammu, uh, which linked Uri to Punch. So, so the would it Peer be Panjal fixed, range, yeah, just one second. Peer Panjal range has three major passes. One is the Banihal pass, which is mm -hmm. being used as the where the Banihal tunnel exists and which is being used as the Srinagar Jammu Highway. Mm -hmm. The second major pass is the Peer Gali, mm -hmm. which connects uh, Ajari to Shopia. Yeah. And the third is from uh, Punch to Uri, which links mm -hmm. Punch to Uri. These are the that is the Haji Peer Gali. Haji Peer. Okay. Ajipir, okay. Now these three places were the Ajipir was captured by the Pakistanis in 1948. Yeah. Therefore, that was uh, not uh, in use. And once Aknur was taken, then this entire region, right from Uri, then Ponch, Rajauri, and up to Aknur, would 
then automatically fall into Pakistani hands. As the Chenab River was a major obstacle after mm -hmm. that. Okay, so that was the what, significance of Akhnur. What would happen is that uh, the line of communication going up north will be cut off, and the Indian Indian armed forces up north will be isolated, and then they would uh, then yeah, it will become more and more challenging for them to sort of keep that area within them, with them, and then eventually it will go away. That so yeah, it was a very very vital point, and it was very important for the Indian armed forces not to lose. A close. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, when uh, the uh, Pakistan Pakistanis decided to launch an armor offensive, Aknur, the uh, approach to Aknur is uh, by and large a plains a plains area. It uh, just at the foothills of the mountains. Okay. So that uh, the Cham Jordia axis, that is the axis where the uh, area is generally plain and armor tanks can be used comfortably they decided to launch an armor offensive armor led offensive mm -hmm. and this offensive was very successful as the indian defenses were uh, there was to say there was like uh, one one <clears throat> one company of punjab police was also there mm -hmm. the indian forces were not very well poised to take on any armor offensive they were infantry components, infantry battalions, and some Punjab police companies were there. These were the people who were holding this particular front. And they could easily be, you know, taken uh, uh, one over by the one by the uh, by any armor offensive. This is what the Pakistanis did. So it seems a little counterintuitive, right? So if Aknur is such a important vital position, why would the Indian armed forces not have enough strength in uh, defending that town? Because they they would have figured it out, right? That okay, that the uh, the Cham Jordia area that's very easy for the uh, for an armor offensive. It is so it can happen, and the Pakistani armed forces can come in through that. What was the reason why it was not it was not as what it was not as nicely defended? as it should have been yeah one it's difficult to say but there was an armored brigade located at aknur to defend aknur okay. so it was there but uh, the well, lc the line of control at that time loc was uh, manned by the infantry and they had very little anti armor protection with them so okay. when this offensive was launched the pakistanis very soon were able to reach within 7 kilometers of aknur this is where the Indian government had to decide, had to take mm -hmm. a major decision. Till this time, the uh, 1965 operations were largely Kashmir-based. They had the operations had not yet, uh, you know, spread to the international border per se. The Punjab okay. front was by and large silent. The Rajasthan and the Gujarat fronts were by and large silent. Okay. Now this is where the when the Criticality started developing in Aknur. The Indian government had to take a decision, and the decision was taken immediately. This is where the calculation of Ayub Khan went wrong. Mm. The decision was taken immediately to launch an offensive into Punjab to remove the pressure from Aknur. Mm. As soon as this offensive was launched, the uh, Punjab is their uh, you know nerve center. And Lahore mm -hmm. is just about 20 25 kilometers from the border. It is not very far from the IB. Mm -hmm. So the threat to Lahore was imminent as soon as this offensive was launched. It's, it, seems, it seems like they made such a huge assumption based on one small da uh, data point that, okay, in, in, uh, the, in, in the Gujarat incident, uh, the political, uh, the, the, political establishment of India did not take a very strong decision. So they will not take any strong decisions in the subsequent operations as well. So let's not put in so much defense mm -hmm. defending no, it Lahore. Is, it, is not, it is not only <laughs> this. There were, other, there were other factors also. Okay. There were other factors also. The Indian uh, 1962 debacle, which India faced against China, mm -hmm. gave reason enough to Ayub Khan to try his luck. That yeah. Indian army was is not capable of fighting, as also they had built up this uh, psychological phenomena, 
that the Muslims uh, and the Pathans, etc., they are great fighters, whereas the Hindus are not uh, very good fighters. Mm. So this particular psychological, you know, thing was drilled in into their men, but it got drilled in into the generals also. Yeah. So, so, so they, they all. Uh, so they obviously haven't haven't met any jats. <laughs> they, haven't met, they haven't met jats. No, they, have. they haven't met Sikhs. They haven't met Gorkhas. They have enough <laughs> jat Muslims in Pakistan army and yeah. in Punjab. Uh -huh. They must have known that. But then uh, their calculations were. I mean, uh, the Ayub Khan used to say openly. Ayub Khan very clearly used to say that no, the Indians cannot fight us. Hindus are not fighters mm -hmm. because they considered uh, the Hindus as the, you know like uh, Gandhis and all that, the peace-loving so people, the business community, etc. It, okay. it it is the same uh, point of view that he had about the Bengalis and everyone. So okay, yeah. that, OK, we we are a superior fighter race and the rest are not. So it sort of yes. went to his head. And he made strategic and tactical decisions based upon uh, that pretty These are assumption. assumptions were at the back of the mind. But yeah. the calculations were that, yes, they were, they were now adequately armed, yeah. adequately weaponed by the United States mm. to now to be able to capture Kashmir, whereas India was facing problems. India did not have the same kind of weaponry. When you look at weaponry at that time, mm -hmm. Indian Air Force had nets, whereas the Pakistan Air Force had saber jets. Mm -hmm. Indian Air Force was no match to the Pakistan uh, Air Force, you know, aircraft at that time, Okay, which they possessed. Similarly, the patent tanks, they were much more superior than the Indian tanks. The India had the Centurion? and the Centurions, basically. Yeah. So, Centurion were the World War II World War II tanks, tanks. tanks. And the patents were like the, the recent, uh, the latest yes. weaponry yes. that they got. Yes. So they were, so our tanks were at least 20 years old. So all venue. these factors, all these factors yeah. went into consideration that the right. Indians uh, don't have the kind of uh, weapons, the kind of armor, the kind of artillery that they can confront the Pakistanis. And therefore, this is the right time for them to go ahead instead of waiting more, giving more time to Indian army to train itself to be able to fight better, etc, etc. Okay. Right. Okay. So now, uh, so now, there are now, seven kilometers we from Aknur. We were at Aknur, yeah. Right. Now, this is the time when the government decided to launch Air Force in full gear. Into mm -hmm. to tackle this uh, armor assault, the Indian Air Force did a fabulous job uh, in controlling in controlling the uh, affairs at Aknur. This uh, particular operation, the somehow or the other, the Indian Air Force had a field day early morning hmm. when they launched an attack, okay. and uh, the Pakistani. Offensive was brought to a halt. Sim so simultaneously, the when the operations in Punjab were launched, the Indian Army was soon on the banks of the Ichogil Canal. Ichogil Canal was the defensive canal just to the east of Lahore that was mm -hmm. made to defend Lahore. Now, this canal surprisingly was uh, sort of unknown to the Indian defense planners. They mm -hmm. were surprised to see a big canal ahead of them as an obstacle. Okay. The Indian uh, Infantry Brigade reached the Chugil Canal. A platoon also, a platoon plus, was able to get across on the other side of the canal also. But mm -hmm. uh, soon the bridge was blown up by the, the Pakistanis. And mm -hmm. they started now getting reinforcement, etc. This is the time when a panic reaction took place in the Pakistani hierarchy. Right. When Pakistanis saw that Lahore is under threat, the, mm -hmm. there was a Bata factory next to the Chubil Canal on the other side. That Bata factory was also for some time in the hands of the Indian uh, Army. Mm -hmm. So this panic reaction, the pen button was pressed, and Ayub Khan moved uh, the moved some uh, moved the you know about an armored brigade from Aknur towards uh, Punjab sector. So. It's in it's interesting that they didn't have any other assets anywhere else. I would I would think that if I was Ayub Khan, I would be like, all right, let's not halt that offensive that's so close to their objective. And I would get a, a armored had, uh, assets from they elsewhere. Had, they had the offensive. There was uh, both the sides had uh, one armored div 
both mm-hmm. one amortive on Indian side, one amortive on the other side. Okay, one amortive is number one. The n- number of the amortive was one. Okay, both the sides. They were both against each other, facing each other. Now they neither did India want to commit its amortive, nor did Pakistan want to commit its amortive mm-hmm. before the other side committed. Because okay. if the um, if the offensive formation, this formation was committed, and the other side launched the offensive, then the other side would able would be able to gain uh, gain ground much faster. So this is where this is where the both the sides were kept. They kept maneuvering their armored divisions, but they did not uh, bring them into battle to that extent. It was so later the, that they were brought into battle. So there were these two arm, uh, these one armored divisions each on both the sides, but they were not committing them, thinking that if the if Initial, one yes. if one side commits first then the other side will have a strategic advantage or tactical yes. advantage and they could attack somewhere else yes yes okay so that so they were waiting so they, were, they were waiting for the other side to make a move first okay. so this kind of situation was there and they had to they halted this halted the operation on the at aknur there was mm-hmm. also this factor of the goc of aknur division getting very you know popular in pakistan so and the GOC at this stage was removed by Yaya Khan by Oyub Khan, and Yaya Khan was put in place. Okay, so this, this GOC that there. we are talking about is General Akhtar Hussein Malik, and uh, he was the one who was leading the offensive, which was Operation Grand Slam into Aknu. Mm-hmm. They're very close to victory. He, be- he starts becoming popular, but he's not Ayub Khan's guy. Ayub mm-hmm. Khan wants his guy to be the victor when finally in their mind Aknur is taken and that is his man Yaya Khan so he's like oh you are on this offensive let's change the GOC at the last moment and then have y- Yaya Khan go in and then uh, continue with the, with the offensive think, so this change must have sort of um, taken some time yeah this change actually gave respect I don't know whether it was Yaya or I think it was Tikka Khan who uh, took over I think it was Yaya Khan okay maybe um, I, we'll I correct think it so. later Okay. Let, let's, I let's can check on it. Okay. Yeah. So this uh, particular change of command gave a respite to the Indian side of about 24 to 48 hours, which was more than enough for Indian side to bring in fresh reinforcements mm-hmm. and to ensure that the defensive perimeter at about 7 to 10 kilometers ahead of Aknur was strong enough to defend Aknur. Thereafter, the offensive, uh, you know, at this stage, the offensive after that petered out. The Pakistan army offensive petered out in Aknur. It lost that steam, the right? Because they yeah, had the momentum, so they stopped, and now they now gaining the momentum all over again yeah. would have that takes a lot more effort. Yeah. Okay. That armored so, brigade, which was to be inducted, that armored brigade went towards uh, to the other sector. So therefore, they did not have fresh armor also to be inducted. So it seems like the troops. So the situation of Aknur, the 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 troops who were defending Aknur initially when the attack came in their role with which they did very well was to stall that offensive as much as possible and then the the second part that played a crucial role is the indian air force that came in and because of the uh, fast and quick political decisions that to engage the air force as soon as possible so they came in they stopped the offensive and the third one was the change of generals at the Pakistani side, which gave enough time for the Indian side to get more reinforcements in and save Aknur in the 1965 war. So these were the three core, core reasons why this, Aknur... There was this decision of expanding the war to the international border. Yeah, that 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 was the main one, as in... Uh, that was the main we, decision. So the reason why we opened the, the Lahore front was so that the Pakistani offensive that's going into Aknur had no option but to stop that and defend their main city and sort of divert some of their resources yes, yes. towards Lahore. So that would be, I would say and that would be the, the the biggest decision for them to completely halt it yeah. and then just uh, and forget Pakistan about counted, it. Pakistan counted on this fact that the uh, the war will remain Kashmir centric, Kashmir centric. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. therefore they had pitched their resources, main resources in Kashmir. Hmm. So India country. will not cross the, in, in the international border because then, they do not yeah. have the political will. Political that was the yeah. okay. that was the thinking. Yeah. Okay. So, so then after so this, this 
1965 war was uh, neither uh, win it was both sides declared that uh, the both sides declared that they had won but mm -hmm. it was a sort of a stalemate kind of a situation after 1965 war also. yeah but neither neither did pakistan get what it wanted nor mm -hmm. uh, india was able to contain uh, or restrict pakistan to within limits and mm -hmm. also gain some territories in critical areas well so it was uh, the uh, yeah the argument that uh, the pakistan side makes is that we won the war because we stopped a greater military from from taking over our our major city lahore and that's why they they uh, they celebrate what victory day or army day on september 6th every year because yeah, apparently they yeah so apparently their point is that we were able to stop a much stronger military from uh, achieving their objective. Well, my counter to that is, well, first of all, in, Indian military's objective was not to capture Lahore. It was basically a diversionary mode, uh, a diversionary tactics so that the resources could be diverted away from Aknur and they had to come and save Lahore, right? So that was not the objective anyway. And the objective achieving the ob ob objective the onus of that resides with the person with the side that starts the war which was pakistan and their objective was to take kashmir and and india's objective was to thwart that effort which they were able to do so my assessment of this is that yeah india didn't win but pakistan definitely lost that's how i like it's it's a stalemate for from a territorial standpoint but from a yeah. strategic <laughs> camp standpoint it's like strategic yeah, standpoint it was a loss to pakistan yes so, because they make this argument that, oh, uh, India was a stronger military. Well, no, because your assumptions, your military assumptions was that India was, the Indian military was weak at this point, And that's why they attacked them in the first place. So you can't have it both ways. No. <laughs> right? No, this so, particular war actually created, gave some, uh, no, clear indications for the future. Mm -hmm. The war was a stalemate. It was an unfinished war. And therefore, yeah. it had to be. Therefore, a war had to be fought again. Oh. It was evident from that time only that so it was a evident. war would be fought again. So it was. It second, was like second sorry, thing sorry. was that the invincibility of the uh, Pakistani West Pakistani, you know, army man or West Pakistani whatever soldier, uh, the soldier, was broken here. Hmm. That they were not what they were boasting of was actually that was a balloon which was blown off mm -hmm. so now at that time what happened was that the bengalis who were already agitating against the, the west pakistani control of east pakistan the bengalis after this got more into offensive mode oh, so, they, so they got confident that because yeah okay got it wow and indian side also realized that uh, we had to we have to fight another war this war was an unfinished war okay. so both sides now started preparing for the next war immediately okay. after the 1965 war indian side uh, started getting more armaments more uh, you know weapons from the ussr and you pakistan also tried to get more more and more get more closer to usa and get more uh, uh, weaponry from us both sides started preparing for the next war wow. this was the actual result of the 1965 war it sort of reminds it, me it of that unfinished business yeah it sort of reminds me of that you know when the first world war ended and then the and the and then the treaty of versailles was signed they knew that uh, an, another war is coming because it was such a humiliating defeat for the yeah. for the germans that they are going to come in they're going to come back and it's not a, a completely parallel thing, but it sort of reminds me of uh, that point at uh, this time. But so, okay, now six, 65 has ended. How would you rate General Musa and General Ayub Khan during this war? Uh, Both were they, average people. Both were average people. They were, uh, they were not uh, capable of taking major strategic decisions. They did not have the caliber, I would say, in mm. plain terms to take major strategic decisions they were uh, in fact uh, like that is how they faltered otherwise they could have taken a crew mm. they could have 
uh, they first in the first place they should not have gone into this war at all if mm -hmm. they had made logical conclusions and okay. uh, if they had uh, uh, gone into the war they should not have delayed delayed or they, they should not have changed uh, the goc midstream at a place where they were already winning that's okay. the only place where they were winning in a major way yeah that would Next i would say not, that was a dumb dumb decision yeah. for sure and i don't know why they did a, that an, another dumb decision was that not to take into account the uh, political decision making of the indian side mm -hmm. when the situation became critical in kashmir so a lot of their assumptions they made assumptions they were based upon some some you know some things in their mind and all of them most of them turned out to be wrong and that yeah. was that, that's what led to and this a loss for them yeah this particular war also brought down the image of ayub khan to a great extent ayub mm -hmm. khan was forced to sign the tashkent agreement bhutto yeah. also went with him but uh, after this bhutto became more bold and east pakistan also pakistanis also became awami league rather became more bold now political turmoil started in pakistan soon after 1966 political mm -hmm. turmoil started in pakistan for okay. a political uh, you know setup to come in place there were large uh, you know rallies disturbances etc against ayub khan rule okay so against the against the military uh, as a whole or just ayub against ayub khan ayub khan against ayub khan, ayub ayub khan, khan became now a figure who was uh, who had lost uh, the you know the will uh, the rather confidence the confidence of the people right. to rule therefore he decided to part ways and he chose yaya khan as his successor yaya khan was another person who would be who would ensure that uh, ayub khan would not be brought to books or something mm -hmm. and uh, ayub khan's chapter would be closed after that ayub khan would quietly fade away into fade away from the his, from history and mm -hmm. yaya khan would uh, then you know take over the reins of the country yaya khan took over in 1968 as the president of pakistan as well as the chief of the army staff by this time the particular the commander in chief had gone away and uh, mm -hmm. general musa's time only mm -hmm. and chief of army staff had come into place the oh, appointment okay. of chief of army staff had come into place and so the difference yaya between khan, the two is that the chief of army staff has a 3 year tenure and the commander in chief had a 4 year tenure yeah okay so now yaya khan took over as chief of army staff and the president in 1968 he gave himself another extension after 3 years and he continued till 1972 when he was forcibly brought down from the chair he was uh, uh, taken down he was brought down by the caller by a brigadier of the pakistan army and told to go home that is we how it was he demoted office we that will discuss uh, that why yeah, why he was why he was thrown he was literally taken off of the chair by one of his own own brigadiers in 1972 and that has got to do with the debacle of 1971 Yeah. Before we go there, do you want to take a break? Yeah, we can take a break. Five, ten minutes break. All right, let's take a ten minutes break, and then yeah. I will review this recording, and then we will just we'll be back after ten minutes, and then we'll continue. Nineteen seventy-one. Why it happened? What was Yahya Khan's role in that? How did the Pakistani military perform in it? And what was the result of that war? All right. So see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.